Joining me today on the Neil Wilkins podcast is Rebecca Vickers, who is the VP of Operations at FMO Media. Now, Rebecca is a what you might describe as a dynamic professional in marketing with experience in both digital marketing and importantly for this conversation, operations. So we are going to be talking about We're going to be talking about client relationships. Uh, We're going to look at strategy. We're going to be definitely talking about leadership and a whole host of operational challenges and issues that you can help solve within your organization and within your team. So, Rebecca, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Neil. It's my pleasure. This is a big old subject, though, isn't it? I mean, I've I've kind of introduced you there and sort of said, yeah, you're going to solve every marketer (laughs) and every business owner's problems here just by kind of going into this stuff. But it is it is broad and it is wide. It is deep and it's kind of complicated, too. Yeah, you're right. And I think the challenge is in making the complicated simple because the more you grow and the more you scale, you actually want to have simpler systems so that everybody can understand and execute on those systems or work within them in a collaborative way that I believe should still be agile too, because you need room to grow, you need some flexibility, but you still need some structure to that. So um, yeah, it it might be a tall order. I can't solve everybody's problems, but I think the, the point is too, that we can all be solutioneers within our organization and we can all come together and create something even greater than what was originally built. And that's where it takes the team. So to your uh, point and insight, it, it's a broad uh, sort of topic and it does go deep. And this is where it takes a whole company to be able to manage that too at the same time. It would be really remiss of me to to kind of not pick up on a word that you've just used there, which was solutioneers. Oh, for somebody who's in operations where, you know, use the word operations and instantly my thoughts go to, okay, it's process, it's process mapping, it's systems, it's, Mm -hmm. you know, IT infrastructure, it's all of those kind of back office things. And then you use the word solutioneers, which is very human. Are you humanizing operations here by any chance? I might be, Neil. (laughs) <laughs> a lot, actually. In in a lot of ways, well, my personal opinion is that your human resources are your greatest resource because you need your team in order to execute on the vision and to keep the company moving forward, no matter how much great technology we have. And I love AI. I love tech. I love the tools and the platforms. But if you don't have the people to manage them, to use them in innovative and creative ways, then you're not going to get very far with that. So your greatest asset really is your human resource, your human asset. And you have to recognize that everybody is human and treat them as such. So um, when I look at operations, I like to think about the systems. I love organization. I, I think that it's my natural default I will also give the caveat that I think everybody is inclined towards some kind of order, whether they know how to do that or not. We all crave that order and organization. And for operations to understand that you're working with people and people have a certain way of consuming content, learning and adapting to change. And we have a certain way that we work together. You have to be in touch with people and how to approach them and talk to them and guide them and lead them in order to have them work within your system as efficiently, effectively, and optimized as possible. Interesting start this, isn't it, in in the conversation? Because I guess for a lot of people, whether they're a team leader in a medium or larger organization, or they're starting to maybe scale a smaller business, and they're thinking, okay, I need to build a team here. Right. Here's this function. Here's that function. I need somebody to do content. I need somebody to do my social media. I need somebody to build the website. I need somebody to do you know, product development. And, and they tend to recruit, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but they tend to recruit based on job title. But I'm picking up here that there's something more human and maybe more into relationship focus that actually could be an advantage rather than just recruiting to a job description? Yeah, absolutely. The culture is so important because that determines how people work together and not just internally, but keeping in mind that 
you have humans as clients too, right? Your clients are human, your customers are human, and you need to make sure that your culture is good so they can also take care of your clients and your customers in the best way possible. And so approaching that understanding, yeah, when it comes to recruiting and hiring, I obviously definitely want to make sure that people feel confident in the role and have the skills and abilities, those hard skills. Um, but the soft skills are equally important. Some of those you can't really teach right away. It takes time to develop. And you want people that come with those or come with the values and the understanding that align with you as a company so that they can integrate into the company in a way that still allows for different points of view, allows for a wonderful, rich environment of different backgrounds and thoughts, but they also understand the core mission and vision of the company and they align with the values there so that you have a really dynamic team that works well, collaborates well together and moves a vision forward. So that's where I see the culture is even more so important because you can have the best perhaps um, ads mind or web developer on the team. But if they don't align with your culture as a company and it goes against their values, you would be doing a disservice to them and they would not feel comfortable and confident on the team to do their best work either. So that's where uh, I think looking at the person as a whole, that holistic approach is really key in recruitment. And then making sure that when you're guiding those team members that you do have on the team, that you're understanding them as a whole person too, not simply looking at them as their skills resource, but as that all encompassing human resource. Yeah, I was, I was going to come to that. And I think that's a really interesting point because I guess as somebody growing up within an organization, inevitably they're going to change, aren't they? I mean, they might come at this with hard skills, but as they go through the organization, either career progression or just time passes, they are going to be at certain points very different people, aren't they? How do we kind of, again, operationally, I guess, and really practically, how do we work with that? Because there's an almost an unpredictability there, isn't there? That as a group of people, you know, individuals, individually, but also as a collective, kind of almost morph over time just because of market dynamics, maybe a, a certain individual in the team kind of upsets or, you know, creates an imbalance. It, it gets very complicated, doesn't it? How do we navigate that? Yeah, I love that question. And I love this topic because it really pertains to development and growth. And if you are a leader within your company, this is where my role is a little bit of a hybrid in that I get to work on that HR side of helping our team grow. And I love development plans and I love prepping for that a year in advance with people. So beginning of every year or within the first 30 days of a new person joining the team, if it's later in the year, we look at a year long growth and development plan we actually are in the midst of our mid-year reviews to see how people are progressing through those. And I'll have them put down their skill set, where they feel strongest in, and then where they feel there are opportunities for them to grow. Not necessarily weaknesses, because while you might want to work on a weakness that you have, it's better to work on your strengths and the opportunities that you see that can align with those strengths. So we're really helping set someone up for success. And I encourage them to put whatever is career focused, but they can also put personal goals down if they feel comfortable sharing too, because then that gets back to the understanding that we're all human. We're complex in our desires and our passions and pursuits. And if I can encourage you or champion you or celebrate you in any additional way, I want to be able to do that. And so them deciding on those goals for themselves we look at that, we put them together in that SMART goal format so that it is specific and measurable, attainable, relevant, timely to help hold them to those goals. And then I can come in and see where I can either support them, encourage. Um, I might not have the background to be able to train them on something, but then I can help identify who on the team does or what third party training or um, technology can I help assist you with that we can then set you on that path. And then I like to do reviews regularly 
most of the team, they have that regular weekly one-on-one -on -one with me anyway, where we're talking through that one-on-ones might shift um, or the topic might need to shift, but we always have that guaranteed mid-year review so we can check in and see how are you working towards your goals? Um, do you need to pivot? Because sometimes goals need to change. Kind of what you were alluding to, Neil, with the understanding that people are going to change. Changes are only constant. And so we can prepare for that by being flexible and having a little bit of a a release of the pressure to perfectly follow a plan. But going back to that cliche that if you don't have a plan, you're planning to fail. I think wrongly attributed to Benjamin Franklin, if I recall. I don't think he actually said that, but the sentiment, the understanding is true that we have to have some kind of structure for ourselves. So long and short, I love putting together that structure for people and with people and letting them take ownership over their growth plan too, so that it aligns with, again, their values, their professional and personal goals, and they feel like they have a little bit more of that buy-in because they do, because it's their plan. And it's not something that I'm imposing on them simply from my outside perspective. Yeah, and that I think is such a fundamental thing, isn't it really? Because we, we all know, and we've possibly even worked in organizations where you know, it's it's the management team who decide. It's kind of this is the role you're performing. There is no leeway. There's no real ownership. It's like here's the strategy. We cascade it down to you. This is it. You either take it and you work it, or you leave it and you go. Um, this feels so much more inclusive. That feels like there's an accountability and a responsibility given. It's almost like a trade here that you're not only going to do the job, but you are going to develop and you're going to be accountable for your development as a member of staff, a member of the team. Does it rely on somebody having an energy to almost take that on board? Because not everybody's going to resonate with that, are they? Because some people like to be steered and almost told what to do. They do. And that's okay too, knowing that about yourself or knowing about team members that maybe want more of that guidance. I love your word choice steered because it is about guiding regardless of what your leadership role or capability is. You might want to be that person who is maybe a leader in a project, but you might want to be the follower and doing your role and working through that role to the best of your ability, but not have the responsibility of that ultimate accountability and team guidance. And that's okay. So when we approach those development plans for the people that aren't inclined towards maybe that higher level responsibility, that's where they'll get a little bit more granular for themselves or a little bit more detail oriented in their specific skill set. And if, um, you know, maybe for our purposes for FMO Media, for example, we have an editor on the team who really doesn't want to take on a team leadership role. They still want to grow within the role that they have and be the best editor that they can be. Or maybe it's an account manager and they really don't want to move up the up the line, up the path of being a team leader, but they really want to be the best account manager they can be. So I would encourage any company to think what are the different levels within a role, because you could have an entry level position, but you can also have the senior level position of that. And the difference between the two might be the amount of knowledge and expertise that that person either brings to the table or grows into. And that's where I think there's room for growth in different ways and facets and avenues that don't press upon someone to be a manager or a leader of other people. They might really want to be the best of the best in their current capacity. Yeah, I love this. There's something really personal about this, isn't there? Because, yeah, it, it, it's kind of... It's not pushing a, um, what's the phrase, square peg into a round hole. This is actually allowing you to, 
yeah, kind of almost find your preferences. Because I, I would say probably early in my career, the only thing I really knew in my you know, when I started out in marketing was that I wanted to try a number of different vertical sectors, so different industries. I didn't want to be pigeonholed into one because I thought in the future, if I want to become consultant or an educator, then I, I'm going to need that flexibility and that breadth of knowledge. And that's played out very nicely, just happens to have worked very much uh, for me. But I guess the alternative to decision would be, as you say, you know, to become a very much a specialist and go deeper, possibly than any of your colleagues or anyone else in a particular discipline or section of, of our industry. And that is also very, very exciting. What happens, though, if somebody given this accountability and this almost free reign to get, is it, I guess it isn't free reign because it's in negotiation with your, your boss and your line manager kind of thing. But if they're given this almost free reign to take accountability and it goes a little bit too far. So they almost become too big or too demanding or put too much pressure on this development thing, almost so that there's no time to actually complete the day-to-day -day job. Mm. How do you deal with that? I think that comes in the beginning with the expectations that you set with that person too. Um, if you are a company that allows for that training in the day-to-day, -day, then you can help them focus that time. Um, I also think it's important if you're talking about ownership, there's also that understanding that you're going to take ownership over your growth and development. And that might take some of your time outside of the normal working hours and having a conversation from the beginning about what someone's able to do and what's realistic for them. That's why I think it goes back to the smart goals, too. What can you actually commit to as a person within the organization, but then for yourself as well. I'll give you an example. Um, there's a team member that was looking at some different certifications that they wanted to take. And they knew they wanted to take one of those, but they had some challenges in their life that they needed to take some time off and really focus on. And we're really big about making sure that you're focusing on most important thing, which is your family. And if you need to take that time off, go for it. And so when we met again to recalibrate and make sure they were set on track, then we figured out what's a realistic amount of time that you can put back towards those goals and refocus the time frame for those goals as well. So I use that to say sometimes your goals might take a little bit of a detour or they might take a little bit of a shift. And depending on what's happening in your life, you might need to either Put them on a side burner or a back burner and really think about what are my ultimate priorities. So I never want team members to feel like they have to give every ounce of additional energy to that. And that's where bringing it back to the integration into the daily life. If you are a company that is especially focused on growth and development and you see the benefit of how it can move the needle forward for you and your company's growth, then build that into your daily, your weekly, your monthly sessions with your team because you can facilitate some of that training for them already. We'll do weekly trainings for groups of team members. We'll do uh, quarterly, we call them hackathons. Um, and I love hackathons because they get everybody innovative and thinking differently. They pull different minds into the room to focus on a solution or solutions for different challenges that we might have. And then we also incentivize different types of trainings and certifications within the industry or the specialty that those team members are in. So that's where I think it's a little bit of the expectation setting. But then how are you set up as a company to facilitate those trainings and encourage them? And then as an individual, being really clear about what your priorities are, what you have time for, so that you can have that discussion and that negotiation back and forth with your manager or leader. Yeah, this this whole idea of kind of quality time, I love that because it, it just feels that this is giving it its rightful place because it just it naturally follows, doesn't it? That if you give anybody, no matter what discipline they're working in, if you give them that attention, that respect and that 
quality of time and really actively listen and then co-create this plan, which can pivot, you know, I love that word, and it can be kind of fine-tuned as you go. And that's a natural, you know, thing as life changes and our, you know, preferences change, our, you know, situations change, everything can change, then we can adapt and we can evolve it as we go. It does require a commitment from management and the member of staff as well, though, doesn't it? This isn't something that's either one-way traffic or it's something you can do very quickly. There's a real requirement to devote the resources to this. I mean, what would you say to an organisation if if the if it culturally it was we haven't got time for this? Um, it depends on perhaps the industry too, but I would, as a default, encourage people to make the time because there needs to be some amount of room for innovation, whether you're creating a team that's specifically devoted to innovation or you're integrating it across your whole team. I would love for anyone to give me the exception to that, what, what industry doesn't need to change or is faced with challenges and changes. But I would say every company is going to be met with those. And so you want to make sure that your team, the people that you have on staff or and even the folks you might have contractors, you might need to update them on changes within your company. You need to build some room for your training. Otherwise, people can stagnate and stall and get stuck. All those wonderful S words. And uh, we can feel like we can't move forward. I've seen that in um, a lot of companies, not just with their people and their team members, but also with their marketing and their operations, they get stuck in doing things the old way and they are resistant to change. And I get it. Change is hard. That's why there's a whole <laughs> understanding of change management and how to navigate that. Um, but you have to recognize that it is that constant. It's going to happen. And one of the best ways that you can facilitate easier change management and pivot or adapt to the times that we're in is to plan in advance with trainings and have that time built in. Um, and I guarantee you that you can make the time for it. It doesn't have to be hours of training, but if you set aside 15 minutes every week or you have that quarterly training or you have a monthly um, workshop meeting it's possible that's where we get into maybe a time management conversation too. And where are you prioritizing your time as a company? Yeah, and I guess this plays out significantly um, in a situation that, you know, we'll know all too well over the last sort of four or five years where we've seen this massive migration to remote working mm -hmm. where we, and I know a lot of the work that you do has been, you know, around that kind of thing because it is something that is, you know, so significant. I think for many teams are particularly kind of marketing, sales, account management, business development, a lot of us now are working remotely. Um, some, some of us are, are hybrid. Some of us are very much more kind of literally at a distance is does does all the same philosophy does all the same kind of operational approaches apply to remote teams or is there or is there almost like a different contract that you have there um a contract is very similar but there's a translation from in office work to remote work if we put it that way, because the conduit is different. We have a screen now versus being in a conference room or in an office. And so I think you need to consider whenever you're working as a team or onboarding someone, what's our team charter or our work guide? What are not just the values that we have, but also what is the way, the mode of working or our team dynamic and how we work that we have solidified for ourselves. So I'll give you an example. Um, our team, we have camera on for all of our Zoom meetings. Now someone might need to step away and turn their camera off. That's okay, let someone know, but we want that face-to-face -face connection whenever we're having a meeting internally and externally with our clients too. Um, another point I would make is the communication. I think there's a huge benefit to being remote in that you have to communicate verbally as well as in writing. Otherwise, people are going to miss things. There's going to be a lack of clarity. 
and you need to be able to get instructions or direction or questions and feedback in some form and fashion. So we use Slack and we have very focused channels for different topics and different teams. And that's allowed us to organize our communication, but we have something we can always refer back to. So there's more clarity, expectation. We can hold our team members and each other accountable. So there are some really big pluses to that. I think the biggest challenge is developing the relationships and that's internal as well as external with clients. And that's where a lot of the work can go into creating an environment that is inclusive. You're reaching out, getting feedback. You're asking for different people's points of view. You're having those brainstorms. You're also encouraging people. You're celebrating them. You're letting them know that it's okay to come to you with a challenge, with a problem, and you're celebrating people in a remote environment that can still feel inclusive and develop engagement there versus letting it be a remote environment where you have limited connection, people feel like they're in a vacuum, and they don't have that, uh, that human element coming to them from the screen or from the Slack zone or from a WhatsApp chat. So there are a couple of different tactics and strategies we could talk through and could probably make that the full <laughs> topic of conversation. But there is definitely a difference. And I would encourage anyone in looking at it to think about the person back to Originally, what we we're talking about is that idea of your human resource. How do they need to connect with you? There are many different learning styles and there are many different communication styles. So are you setting up your company successfully to communicate together and to engage with each other ultimately? Yeah, because that's a fundamental one, isn't it? Because I know when I have this conversation with either clients or just people generally, and they say, well, how do you manage to rem remote work? You know, 98% of the stuff you do, Neil, seems to be kind of remote working. I think, yeah, it's wonderful, isn't it? I mean, I am an off the scale introvert in terms of the, the spectrum of introversion and extroversion. So for me, it is just wonderful. I can literally lock myself away, become process driven. I can communicate when I need to, but I think I'm right. But the preference is very, very much introvert. So I have no issue at all, literally being locked away for a day. I don't need to be talking to people. It's ironic for somebody who's, who's got a podcast, isn't it? I mean, it's just <laughs> crazy, really. But it's the reality. But I get that for the more extrovert preference, um, or kind of, you know, innate nature, it is so, so important to be able to retain that connection. It, do, do you find from your experience, Rebecca, that, you know, people who are a little bit more or um, let's call them extroverted, um, almost spend more time making the effort to communicate when they're working remotely than actually when they're in the office or when they're collectively in a team because they feel mm -hmm. this lack of or this almost this disconnect because of the technical boundary. Is it, is it, is it that they almost have to try even harder in the remote sense? Mm -hmm. They might have to when it comes to the, the method or how they're communicating within that mode of communication. I consider myself an introvert as well, which is equally ironic because I'm on a podcast. I was in theater and film for very many years. And um, I think there's an element of that where I, like you, appreciate being able to quietly focus on my work at hand. But then there's also that element of I love coaching and training and, and helping the team grow and move forward. So perhaps I'm a hybrid now. Um, but what I've seen with folks who maybe prefer that more solitude, quieter approach, that it's the confidence and encouraging them that you have this Slack channel to communicate when you have challenges do let us know what challenges you're facing and your solution, because if you're having a problem, maybe somebody else is having a problem and that helps us identify it faster. We also have individual Slack channels for team members with them and just management. So if they feel a little bit more reticent to approach the full team, they can come to us a little bit more directly and feel like they have that safer space to communicate um, we're also really mindful that we don't have a lot of team meetings because people need time to get the work done. 
We also still need to meet and convene at points throughout the week so that everybody's updated, so that people can have a chance to give insight and to give feedback. So that's where I think it's a little bit of a balance and creating that space for the person to work, creating a space for them to come to you directly if they they don't feel like approaching the full team and then having that space for everybody to gather. And then when you're in those Zoom meetings, the introverts might be more reluctant to talk on those calls. And I recognize that because I've been there myself. So I like to make sure people know they can use their Zoom chat function and pop a message in the Zoom chat and not feel required to verbally speak out on a call. So they have that option too. And that's where I think the understanding of creating an inclusive environment in your remote space is so important. It might feel a little bit easier in a work office space, but I've seen it be a challenge for people there too. And in some ways it might be easier for the introverts online because you have the chat function and you don't feel like you have to raise a hand in a meeting and shout something out and verbally be a part of a discussion. Mm, I love that word inclusion there. If it really feels that this is this is proper inclusion, it's not just paying lip service to something that we all know is really important. Uh, but I guess, you know, I, I see and I'm sure you do as well, you know, opportunities here to improve things, you know, in this whole inclusive way, because I think if we can take the time, if we can be mindful, if we can just really truly listen and understand then we're going to have those contracts, if we call them that contract with a, a lowercase c, but those contracts with uh, the team and with our leadership that actually mean something and is actually really kind of personalized and relevant. Sounds great. Sounds really good. You, you've talked there about a, a number of um, different technologies. So Slack is, is one there that you've mentioned. What, what, are, what are you seeing in terms of, because obviously this whole idea of marketing operations is very broad. It is obviously very much the human that we've been talking about, but there's also so the system and the process that kind of supports the human within marketing. What, what are you seeing the transitions are here to kind of, you know, some of the emerging technologies? I mean, Slack obviously is, is one example of a sort of collaboration platform. Um, are there others that you're kind of either recommending or seeing working right now? Yeah, so Slack is great because it it's what... Um, we use, I like to say, it's our communication tool for the work and to connect as a team. But then Asana is the communication tool we use to follow our projects through to completion and to track our tasks. So that's more of our um, platform for accountability, reminding ourselves what we have and following a pipeline for all of our services and our deliverables. And I have yet to find one platform that can do it all. Um, so if you're a developer out there and you're listening, <laughs> be great to have one space because I think you have to have that at least one space where people know to go to for certain elements. So we have Slack for that communication. For our clients, we actually use WhatsApp chat so that they have one space to go to and we can get the whole team that is working with that client involved in their WhatsApp chat. Um, and then Asana is that one-stop shop for the deliverables. And then we'll have different platforms we use for other areas. Um, Frame.io is a great platform for storing video content and managing your video content. It's great because not only does it create that storage, that cloud storage space, but it also lets you send video content for review, approval, and comments, which is way easier than any platform I've ever seen and facilitates that back and forth between a client a lot easier too. Because um, I think, Neil, you probably know as well, just from a marketer's perspective, you don't want that friction with any kind of technology with your clients or with your team. And so I like to keep things as streamlined my team knows that's one of my favorite words, streamline or streamline as possible so that people don't have to log into various platforms and make all these different uh, Zapier connections or integrations that can confuse and overwhelm. And if one part fails, then the other part fails. You want to keep it as simple as possible, especially as you're growing. Um, and within that, make sure that you're using the tools and the technology 
to the fullest capacity so that your team has that buy-in with your technology as well. Um, so that's sort of my general approach to it and then some of the platforms that we like to use. But I have yet to see one marketing operations platform fully tackle it all. So anyone listening out there that wants to tackle that, I'm happy to give some insight and some feedback into. Yeah, I just want to pick up on a word that you used there, Rebecca, which was pipeline. I found that was quite an interesting word because it, it kind of implies that this is very, as well as being operationally kind of internally focused, it's very customer focused too. It almost always has, when we talk about sales pipeline or marketing pipeline, it is that process of customer engagement. And so are you kind of overlaying customer requirements, customer service and stuff on top of this, or is it... Is it, is it sitting somewhere different? How does that work? It's very much overlaid and integrated. And I'm glad you picked up on that too, because the connector is if your team is taken care of, then your customers, your clients are taken care of. If your team does not feel taken care of, they're not going to take care of the work and the clients that they are working with to move your company forward. And that's where the integration especially comes into play. I, um, one of my roles, what I started as a digital marketer, but one of my roles was client services director before I took over the VP of operations position and made that uh, its own position. And so having traveled that journey, I got to start with managing clients and then managing a team and then managing a specific team and department. And then from there, seeing how they all work together um, so that's how I approach it from an understanding of the overlap. And then the pipeline understanding is, yes, when it comes to clients, you need to make sure that you have clear expectations, that they know what's happening. That's where communication comes back into play. And you as a team need to understand internally um, your resources you have available to help those clients, um, expectations for time frame of deliverables and be able to communicate that internally as well as externally with your clients so everybody's aligned and on the same page. And then you also wanna make sure with that client experience and relationship that it's a good experience. And that's where alleviating the friction comes back into it. If your systems are overly complicated, then it's gonna make it overly complicated for a client to get what they need from you. And that's where you want to simplify, simplify the more and more you grow and consider their point of view. What's the experience that you're giving them? How are you delivering the deliverable? What's the mode of communication? How are you expressing those expectations? And so that's where it's important to have that order in your pipelines and make sure that your team has a structure and a system to follow through, then they can spend a little bit more time developing the relationship with the client and less time trying to figure anything out as they go because it's built out and you have that agreement. I love your little c contract term because I think that's important. You have that contract as a team. This is how we're going to move the work through and forward. And then you have that relationship with the client that you can focus on. Mm. So with all that in, in mind then, so we've kind of almost, we've built this, this framework then, we have people in it, we've got processes, we've got some technology. Um, some people are thinking, yeah, but that's all very well, but I can strip all of that out and just use AI. I can use AI agents, I can create a process with AI, I can bundle all this stuff together and I can do it within a fraction of a second, something that's going to take, you know, a human being or a team of humans, you know, months and months to do, I can do it in a fraction of a second. Oh, and they don't need to take um, annual leave and oh, yeah, they don't have to go home to treat the, the sick cat or whatever. What's Rebecca's response to that? Well, I think well, we all know over the last couple of days how challenging technology has been and computers fail. <laughs> and once they do, then the whole globe is disrupted, uh, which we saw with the Microsoft and CrowdStrike outage. Um, so that's just a good current reminder that relying on technology at the end of the day, I mean, it's human built anyway, so there are going to be flaws to it because we as humans are flawed. Um, but you still need people to manage the technology. And AI does not have that 
human element that has empathy and compassion and has the creativity that a human being does, it also needs to be prompted. So you need someone prompting the technology and working with it to get the outcome that you need. Um, it's what you put into it that you get out of it too. So you do have to have some level of skill and knowledge in how to use your AI technology or any technology, right? For that matter. So it might be able to replace elements of a job and of a role, but I see it as taking over the tedious tasks that a team has and replacing that tediousness with something more efficient so that the team member then can spend time being creative, spend time building relationships with their clients. You might be able to have a really small but mighty team because of AI, but you still need that human element to manage it, to run it, and to guide it, to use your word, steer it in the direction of where you need it to go so that your company can grow at the same time too. That's, I feel, just such a profound way of describing it because we, there's so much hype, but a lot of us have got swept along with this opportunity to become, you know, uber efficient, you know, super efficient um, and, and really creative. Mm, yes, but on, obviously based on, you know, stuff that's already been written or already created, it's just regurgitating the same thing. So we need to, yes, as you say, have the human element in there guiding and prompting on the, on the journey. What is your, to kind of round off this kind of discussion of all the kind of facets, and it's been you know, fascinating for me actually thinking about all of these facets of marketing operations. What's your view of the future? Are you, are you positive of the future of marketing operations generally? Do, do you think we're going to a good place? I do. I think, um, you know, to your point, there's a kind of overwhelm of technology and AI out there, and we might still be navigating that but I think it's a lot easier if you can focus in on what's my goal, what do I need out of technology, what kind of team do I need to structure and build, and you understand your why and your goal as a company, there's so much out there that you can leverage. You just need to be focused and make a very focused decision on what you're using and understanding that why comes first, because then you'll understand the how and the what that you're using alongside of it. But I think we're living in a time uh, that allows us with all of these wonderful opportunities of tech and of different skill sets. And the remote aspect allows us to have a team and a larger team or a more diverse team because there is no boundary, physical boundary. We have all these wonderful resources at our disposal. We have all these opportunities to connect with other people. It's one of the best times. So I'm very hopeful. I think it's just a reminder for us to still stay focused on why we are doing something so that we don't lose the forest for the trees because I could see us getting very wrapped up in new technology that's out there or sometimes it's repackaged technology. Sometimes it's just chat GPT repackaged uh, as a new different platform, which is okay, but it's very easy to get lost in the shuffle of it. So that's where I would encourage people to always get back to your why, as Simon Sinek says, start with why, um, and make sure that you understand what your ultimate goals are as a company. But I really do think we're living in a wonderful time where we can create that structure, we can create that supportive, encouraging environment for growth. And we also have a wonderful ability to network with other people. We don't have to info hoard. We can have these conversations and we can share what we know because every company is going to have a different why and a different goal. So there's an opportunity to come together and collaborate alongside of each other too. Wonderful. I'm going to vote for you, Rebecca. Yeah. <laughs> you, you've worked this one through. I think, you know, there's almost like no stone is unturned. I think, 
yes, this is uh, this is really this is how you do it, people. This is marketing operations properly done. If people want to stay connected with you, I know you've got a lot of other projects and and things kind of going on. Do you want to just say a quick little word about those and then how people can connect? Yeah, so I've got a lot happening, as you mentioned. Um, I actually have started self publishing, which I'm very excited about. Making some announcements there too. I love when people uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. So because I have all of those things going on, you can find me on my link tree at Rebecca Vickers. Um, you can also just connect with me directly on LinkedIn to Rebecca Vickers on LinkedIn. I would love to chat further. Like I said, um, let's not info hoard. So I would love to chat and connect with anyone that wants to share knowledge or their expertise or um, get some conversation going on anything marketing or operations leadership related. So we'll be happy to chat. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, we're going to share this one far and wide, Rebecca, and I really appreciate your time and uh, and wisdom. I mean, so many things I've, I've pushed in your direction here since the very, very first kind of introduction words that I said. And it's like, oh, my goodness, if I can go and answer for everything, it's great. <laughs> and this is this is you know, so, so positive. So thank you so much for your, your time and wisdom today. Thank you, Neil. It's been my pleasure.